Hello soon to be licensed nurse practitioners. My name is Miss Cohen and I am presenting you another blog. And today I am going to go over lab interpretation. Very important for nurse practitioners because when we first see our patients coming into an office with certain complaints, it is important to do a blood test that will give us some ideas to what may be happening. Now, I know in school they've taught you what to look for in the white blood cells and the red blood cells, but there's a lack of knowledge as to the differential diagnoses that can come up with evaluation on this blood work. So what I'm going to do today is go over each type of blood test that we order, the basic kind, to give you an idea as to why we look for these numbers. What do the numbers tell us? What could be some possible differential diagnoses? What could be the patient suffering from or not be suffering from? So let's dive into and let me show you what we're going to discuss today. I am going to go over the CBC or complete blood count, the basic metabolic panel, comprehensive metabolic panel, lipid profile, thyroid stimulating hormone, INR or international normalized ratio, the A1C level, iron panel, electrophoresis, and ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Let me make it clear, there are many other tests that you can order, but these are the ones that are basic. And for that reason, I think it's important that we go over each one of them. So let's get started with the complete blood count, also known as a CBC. The CBC gives you primarily information about three types of cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And I want to go over each one of them as to what it may indicate depending on the results. So the CBC it pretty much provides information about cells in the person's blood, such as the size of the cells, the shapes, and it can give us information about the health of the individual and how they're doing. So why is it helpful? Well, for many reasons. For one, you can check the general health. You can diagnose conditions. You can check for medical conditions. You can check on medical treatment response. And uh, did you remember in school, did they ever teach to you the white blood cells as never let monkeys eat bananas? Never for uh, neutrophils, L, let for lymphocytes, E for uh, eosinophils, B for bananas, for basophils. Um, I just thought it was cute to bring that up. But yeah, never let monkeys eat bananas for the white blood cells. But most importantly, what does it mean if the white blood cell comes back elevated or decreased? One that I am sure you're comfortable with interpreting is that if, the elevate, if there's an elevation of the white blood cell, you're thinking infection, but it could also mean other things. It could mean inflammation, such as from smoking or medications. Medication can cause leukocytosis or an increase in white blood cells, such as steroids or lithium. Exercise, exercise is a form of inflammation. Correct? So that can cause leukocytosis, stress of any sort, and cancer such as leukemia. If the white blood cell count is low, and this could happen, I like to think of after infections, uh, pretty much is due to the usage of their white blood cells. So if you use all of them, then the infection resolves, there may be a low count as the body is trying to replenish. Cancer medications can cause neutropenia or leukopenia, meaning penia little, or uh, immune-related, like lupus, can cause leukopenia, little weight uh, blood cell count, and cancers, certainly. Now, an important um, cell that we see the count in the differential, the differential means that there's a little bit more information about the white blood cells, it's something called the bands. The bands are immature white blood cells. And the reason why it's important to look at this number is because the immature white blood cells will increase as there's a demand for white blood cells because there's a new infection or something. So we see this happen first. Immature white blood cells get created before the mature white blood cell count goes up. And that could be an indication that there's a storm about to happen or pretty much a big infection. Uh, this is, um, there's a term for 
a very high level of bands. It's called bandemia, bandemia. It's more than 10% of bands in the blood, uh, plus an infection, plus inflammation. But keep that in mind if you see an increased band count. Think, okay, the body is uh, responding to a big storm about to happen. All right, so let's talk about the red blood cells. Now, the main function of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen. And that's why when somebody is anemic or they present with a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, they may present with symptoms of anemia, fatigue, palpitations, dizziness, pallor or pale skin. If the body is not receiving enough oxygen, the body will run on low. It will kind of want to shut down, trying to shut down the organs because of the low availability of the oxygen in the blood. And the heart has to pump faster and harder, hence the palpitations, to try to make up for the oxygen that is not sufficient in the blood. It wants to pump more blood to try to get more oxygen. Now, hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen oxygen from the lungs to the body, and then it brings back carbon dioxide to the lungs. Hemoglobin levels uh, give an indication of the blood's ability to carry oxygen, while hematocrit gives more of an accurate estimate of the hemoglobin. But for the purposes of the exam, all you need to know is that we look at both, the H and H, hemoglobin and hematocrit, when we look at anemia. Now, the red blood cells may be elevated due to, for example, issues with the lungs, um, such as lung disease from smoking, sleep apnea, sometimes use of diuretics, high altitudes, anabolic steroids, cancers of the kidney, liver, the adrenals, if there's uterine fibroids, and polycythemia, poly meaning many, cythemia meaning lots of cells. Polycythemia is when we see lots of cells being produced in the body, in the blood. Now, low red blood cell count, common ones are iron deficiency anemia, bleeding, kidney disease, because the kidney plays an important role in making red blood cells, cancer, medications, vitamin deficiencies, B12, it's a form of anemia, uh, radiation because of the destruction of the red blood cells, pregnancy due to the demand, there's two people now consuming the same supply that is usually made and um, overhydration due to the uh, too much dilution. And then we have platelets. Platelets primary function is to uh, help the blood with clotting so we don't bleed out. High levels of platelets are found with inflammation such as vasculitis or inflammatory arthritis. We see that with anemia, with trauma and burns, because the body's trying to clot, uh, heart attack, again, some kind of inflammation, chronic infections, allergic reactions, we see it with lymphoma, some medications. Now, reasons for having low platelet count could be one issue known as clumping. Some people, not common, but I've seen it does happen, uh, their platelets will clump in a CBC sample. And what that means is that they will give a false uh, result of the platelet count. So the uh, technician, whoever reads the blood uh, sample will say, hey, listen, I see some clumping. You may want to take uh, another sample or a more detailed sample um, because what they see on the smear on the slide, rather than seeing just normal numbers of platelet cells, they'll see clumping of them or the sample itself, whatever slide they're looking at, they may see just very few platelets. And then when they start moving the slide around, they'll see the clumping. So if it's the first time that the platelets are low, just keep that in mind. Maybe a second sample may not be a bad idea. Uh, some medications can cause thrombocytopenia, thrombos, it's the, the thrombus, cytocelpenia little, so low platelet thrombocytopenia. Some medications like quinine, heparin, sulfur drugs, Bactrim, some antibiotics like Vanco, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, alcohol. Uh, there are some immune-related conditions like lupus. Uh, B12 deficiency, pregnancy, and cancer can also cause thrombocytopenia. Let's talk about the basic metabolic panel, also known as BMP, also known as CHEM7. You may hear it as CHEM7. We're talking about the same thing. Now, the basic metabolic panel and the comprehensive metabolic panel, which I'll go over next, these are chemical panels 
where multiple chemical tests are grouped in a single profile for the ease of ordering, since this group of tests are often medical necessary. So first I wanna talk about basic metabolic panel because the comprehensive metabolic panel is the basic metabolic panel plus. Now, in the basic metabolic panel, the reason why it's really important, for one, we look at all the electrolytes. So let's say an elderly patient shows up and they have confusion. This is a very important lab you gotta look at. What if they have electrolyte dysfunction due to dehydration? Because if your electrolytes are out of whack, there will be confusion. And you can replenish these very easily, either by ordering the supplement or administering it intravenously or orally. Then we also see kidney function, such as the BUN, creatinine, um, and you can calculate the GFR. We also uh, see the glucose level. I mean, that's very basic, right? Because hypo or hyperglycemia can cause lots of symptoms such as confusion, disorientation. So a very important panel to look at. Now, in the kidney function portion of the BMP, um, we see the creatinine, the BUN, and the BUN, BUN creatinine ra ratio. Now, keep something in mind, and this is important for the exam. As the kidney function decreases, meaning as the kidneys stop working as well, in other terms, trying to keep it super simple, as the kidneys are not as good or don't function as well, the creatinine level will increase. Again, as the kidney function decreases, as the kidneys don't work so good, the creatinine level will go up. So the higher the creatinine level, the worse the kidneys are. Keep that in mind. Serum creatinine, um, it is decreased in, in the elderly. It's not uncommon just simply because of reduced muscle mass. So don't freak out if you see a low creatinine in the elderly. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a disease. They're just old and, and it's due to the low muscle mass. Some meds can elevate the serum creatinine. Now, let me just simplify. When I say serum, I mean blood. Okay, so serum, I mean blood. Creatinine in the serum, serum creatinine meaning creatinine in the blood sample. So the medications that can elevate serum creatinine include um, trimethoprim, which is an antibiotic, uh, cimetidine, which is an acid blocker. Now the BUN, the BUN, I like to think of it as uh, the, the higher it is, the more waste there is. The lower it is, the less waste. So for example, uh, let me start with a low BUN. Low BUN could be due to fluid overload, again, because of the dilution, malnutrition, severe liver disease, something called SIADH, which is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, um, and, and these are the reasons why it would be low. But most importantly, when it's high, when it's high, it occurs either because of kidney damage, uh, such as because of CHF, shock, dehydration, and dehydration can come in the form of vomiting or diarrhea. So the higher the BUN, the more waste product that the body holds. Then we have something called the BUN creatinine ratio. It is elevated with um, heart failure, blood loss, dehydration, salt depletion, uh, a GI bleed, and it will be decreased with severe liver disease, SIADH, pregnancy, rhabdo, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, and then I also wanted to talk to you about GFR. GFR is the ability of the kidneys to filter blood. And it goes down, uh, then the serum creatinine goes up, so it's opposite. It is higher in men than in women, and we can calculate the GFR by using a calculation called MDRD, uh, which, look, which uses sex, age, and the serum creatinine. Now, you can Google this calculation, MDRD, and figure out the GFR, but at hospitals, once you order the basic metabolic panel, it automatically calculates the GFR for you, so that will be accessible to you. And the comprehensive metabolic panel, comprehensive meaning it's it's got more than the basic, is the basic metabolic panel plus 
additional lab tests, which I have here in front of you. Uh, most importantly, the liver, the liver function. The AST, the ALT, and the bilirubin is really um, the reason why I personally order the comprehensive metabolic panel. But it also gives you information about alkaline phosphate, total protein, and albumin. And one thing I want to bring to your attention in regards to the liver function is a term called transaminitis. Transaminitis pretty much means an elevated AST ALT. It refers to usually high levels of a family of enzymes called the transaminases, transaminases, and possibly causes include non-alcoholic related fatty liver disease and or alcohol related fatty liver disease. Transaminitis is not a disease, but it can point to other issues that require treatment. So if you do see an elevated AST or ALT, or if you do see transaminitis with your patient, you will want to order an ultrasound of the abdomen and uh, check the liver and see how the liver is doing. And then possibly, depending on the results, you may need to refer them to GI. Another thing to keep in mind about AST and ALT uh, elevation is that it can happen with any form of cirrhosis, hepatitis, drug toxicity, biliary disease, rhabdomyolysis, acute uh, myocardial infarction, and hemolysis. Me personally, working in the cancer field, we deal with medications that can be toxic to the liver. And it is not uncommon to see an elevation in the AST and the ALT after having introduced a new drug. So we check on this periodically, and when we do see the elevation, we have to either cut back or discontinue the drug we introduced, and then make sure that the levels go back to normal before we either decide to introduce the drug again, for example, at a reduced dose, or simply uh, change it to a different drug because of uh, not being able to tolerate it. Um, another thing I want you to know about AST and ALT is that a ratio greater than two AST to ALT, a ratio greater than two in a patient will probably mean liver disease strongly suggestive of alcoholic or alcoholism. Albumin is a good, um, uh, thing to look at in the CMP. Uh, let me, let me tell you a little bit about albumin. Albumin is a protein and is produced by the liver. It comprises about half total of the protein found in the blood. And its primary function is to maintain that capillary oncotic pressure. So when we have low albumin level in the blood or a patient, you will see fluid leaking into the interstitial space. And what that means is that the patient will present with pitting edema of the lower extremities. Uh, or sometimes the abdomen may develop ascites. Ascites is that accumulation of fluid in the abdomen in the interstitial space. They almost look like they're pregnant, but all it, all, all it is is that fluid accumulation. Now you can replenish albumin and this could be corrected, uh, but that's what I want you to uh, know about albumin. Let's talk about lipid profile also known as a lipid panel, same thing. The lipid profile measures the amount of cholesterol and triglycerides in the blood. Now, cholesterol and triglycerides are important for cell health, but it can be harmful if they build up in the blood. Um, these uh, numbers I got from UpToDate, which is what we use uh, in my office, uh, as a resource for information. So that's where these numbers come from. So if you see a slight difference on the, on the values, because you're looking at a different um, uh, reference, it shouldn't be more than a couple points up or down, but this is directly from up to date. And you can see the values that red means is definitely not good, dangerous. Yellow means is already not good, but um, you know, like a heads up warning. And the green level is ideal. For the triglycerides, you want these to be less than 150. Now, where do we find triglycerides? Triglycerides is a fat in the body. Um, normal level will be less than 150. High levels of triglycerides can cause heart disease, heart attacks, stroke. High levels are associated with pancreatitis. That's why uh, we need to tell our patients, watch your diet, low in fat. We don't want you to be suffering from the conditions I just mentioned. 
Then we have HDL and LDL. Now I learned that H is for healthy, HDL is our healthy fats. These are the high density lipoproteins. You find this healthy fats in avocados, nuts, oatmeal, olive oil, and fatty fish. They're healthy, but it also should be consumed in moderation. Not because they're healthy, you're gonna have seven avocados for breakfast, no. Uh, you teach patients if you're gonna have fats, focus on these. LDL or low density lipoprotein, the L think of lethal, they're bad. These are the fried foods, uh, full fat and dairy, butter, palm oil. Stay away from these foods if you're, uh, if you're trying to lower your LDL or your cholesterol in general. Now, for more information on hyperlipidemia medication management, please see the free blog that I have on the Cohen Review. All my blogs are free, but there's one specific titled Statins, Fibrates, or Niacin. And I go over the lipid profile, the numbers, what they should be, and how to treat. The next thing is the thyroid stimulating hormone or their TSH. Now, the thyroid gland produces TSH. The thyroid gland is the butterfly um, uh, gland located in front of the neck. The thyroid gland is controlled by the pituitary in the brain. Uh, remember, these glands are all endocrine glands. And uh, the thyroid is actually located right below the Adam's apple. <laughs> the pituitary in the brain releases TSH to stimulate the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. Uh, think of like a thermostat. It gets activated to stimulate the hormone when there's low levels. And the best way to test initially the thyroid function is by looking at the TSH, but it's an indirect way of looking at it because ideally you check the T3 and T4, but the best way to initially test the thyroid function is by looking at this TSH. Now, remember for the purposes of the exam, you need to uh, know how you would uh, manage the medication, Synthroid, Levothyroxine, such as if the TSH is elevated, it means that the T3 and T4 are low. So what do you do with the medication? You have to increase uh, Synthroid. Uh, and the same thing is the opposite. So somebody presents to your office and they complain of, you know, feeling cold, constipation, they've gained weight, they have slow thinking, decreased energy. These could be symptoms from high low, low, hypothyroidism. So check the TSH. What do you expect to see in the results? It would be elevated, meaning hypothyroidism. Some causes of hypothyroidism could be autoimmune, such as Hashimoto. It could be a thyroid dysfunction due to medication, such as some of chemo drugs that I give. The immunotherapy drugs that we give in the cancer setting can cause this. We check on the TSH quite regularly. Uh, when you remove the thyroid gland um, or part of the gland for whatever reason, clearly it's going to produce less levels. Radiation to the thyroid can cause hypothyroidism. Excess treatment of antithyroid medication. Maybe you're giving too much drug. Maybe the patient didn't understand the instructions and they're taking too much. There are some drugs that can cause low levels of thyroid. These include methimazole and prophyl thiouracil. <laughs> now, causes of hyperthyroidism include Graves' disease, multinodular goiter, that's when they're swelling on the neck, thyroid inflammation, or thyroid gland dysfunction due to medications. How about excess thyroid hormone therapy? So um, make sure that always that the patient is taking the medication correctly because this could cause issues both ways. Now, T4, or thyroxine, is the primary form of thyroid hormone circulating in the blood. It's about 95%. Uh, and an elevated T4 uh, could be due to medications like estrogen, oral contraceptives, pregnancy, liver disease, or hepatitis C infection. Low levels of the T3 could be steroids. Uh, high levels of T3 would be like Graves' disease. But for the purposes of the exam, just keep in mind, um, especially how to regulate with the medication depending on the results. So feel comfortable interpreting the results of TSH. 
Now, there are two terms that I want you to become familiar with, primary hypothyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism. Let me tell you the difference. Primary hypothyroidism means that the TSH is elevated and the T3 or T4 are low. That's primary hypothyroidism. But there's something before that called subclinical hypothyroidism. That means that the TSH is high, but the T3 and T4 could be normal. So maybe eventually, if untreated, you'll, it'll convert into a primary hypothyroidism. But right now, that's subclinical hypothyroidism, high TSH, normal T3 or T4. For a detailed thyroid interpretation or thyroid levels interpretations, I welcome you to check the Cohen Review Lectures under the Endocrine um, Review. Then we have the International Normalized Ratio or the INR. And you need to know this because it's commonly seen in primary care, so most likely you will see on the, on the exam. This is checked uh, regularly for people who are taking Coumadin, the blood thinner. And what you need to know for the exam, again, is how to manage the medication depending on the results. So let me give you a little bit of background. Now, uh, PT, I know you hear about PT and PTT. These are two values that you uh, will order in blood work as well. Now, PT is a protein made in the liver and is a clotting factor. Now, clotting factors help form a clot in the body to prevent a patient from bleeding. If blood clots slowly, you may bleed too much after an injury. If your blood clots too fast, it's dangerous because an actual clot may form that is dangerous to your health, such as a, a clot in the lung, and then it prevents you from breathing, or a clot in the brain, um, which prevents blood supply to the brain. PTINR is often used to check levels of warfarin or Coumadin uh, and to see how it's working. We have a narrow uh, margin um, of therapeutic range that we have to keep an eye. There are two different INR interpretations or ranges. One is for a systemic embolism or prevention of and the range for the INR is between two and three. But if you're giving Coumadin or Warfarin because of, because of a prostatic valve, the range becomes 2.5 to 3.5. So what you have to know is what would you do? And let me focus on the range between two and three to keep it simple. If you check somebody's uh, INR and the result comes back at 1.5, what do you do with Coumadin? Well, look at the diagram I created here for you. So what it means is that if the INR is on the closer to the left side or closer, um, if the range is two to three, if it's more on your left side on the screen, it means that the blood will clot easier. Uh, and we don't want the blood to be too thick. So if you have someone on Coumadin and the INR is less than two, it means you need to thin the blood a little bit more. So what do you do? You increase the dose of Coumadin. The opposite is if somebody's INR comes back at, let's say number four, it's above thera therapeutic. It means that the patient is at a higher risk of bleeding. Look at the arrow, look at the finger bleeding. The blood is too thin. So what do you do with Coumadin? You have to decrease it to make it a little bit thicker. So that's why we check INR to check the therapeutic um, dose of the Coumadin and adjust the medication accordingly. And we have hemoglobin A1C. I know you're familiar with hemoglobin A1C. We see it from uh, registered nurse school. We see it again with nurse practitioner. But did you truly know what it meant, what the numbers meant? That's why I thought it was interesting to present to you this chart to give you a visual of what the A1C score meant. Now, the A1C uh, is a blood test that measures the average of the sugar levels in the past three months. Uh, and this is used to diagnose diabetes. It helps with the management of diabetes. Uh, and certainly, you should consider the fasting glucose and random glucose for diagnosis in addition to the A1C, 
But the reason why this is very helpful is because someone may behave and eat very healthy two days or three days or not eat right before they do a blood test and you may miss that they have diabetes. Now this, looking at three months worth, gives the doctors an idea of what their sugars have been for the past three months. So let's look. Now the recommendation is to keep it closer to six and under, preferably under, that's why it's green. Once you get to level seven or eight, the sugars have already been elevated at 150, 180. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, look at the numbers. The, that means that the average glucose has been 200s, 300s. So definitely keep it closer to under 6 if you can. That's our goal. But if you want more information as to uh, the goal for our elderly patient or someone who's already on diabetes medication, I go into further details in the Cohen Review Lectures under the Endocrine Review. So, you have a patient that presented with fatigue, palpitations, headache, dizziness, and you check the CBC, and the H and H or the hemoglobin and hematocrit came back low. So now you know they have anemia. What do you order next? You should order an iron panel. An iron panel is composed of total iron binding capacity or the TIBC, a serum iron. The serum iron is the iron floating in the blood. Then you also check the transferrin saturation. The transferrin saturation, I describe it as a uh, carton of eggs. Think of a carton of eggs. When the eggs are in their spot, it means that it's full. But when there are eggs missing from the carton of eggs, you have spaces that are ready to bind with iron. So this number will be high when the iron levels are actually low. And then we look at the ferritin level for the purposes of the exam. Remember that the ferritin is the diagnostic for iron deficiency anemia. Serum ferritin is the stored iron. So this is what we look at, not the serum iron, but definitely the ferritin as a diagnostic for iron deficiency anemia. In addition to the iron panel, you should also order a B12 level and a folate level. Um, also, depending on the MCV results you saw on the CBC, the MCV is the size of the cells because remember, if it's less than 80, you're thinking of a microcytic anemia such as iron deficiency or thalassemia. But if the MCV is greater, uh, you may be thinking more of a folate or B12, but I don't want you to just order those depending on the MCV. Sometimes the MCV may be normal and you may still see uh, a micro or macrocytic anemia. Now, iron uh, panel helps with diagnosing of iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, also anemia of chronic disease, um, acute phase reaction anemia, iron overload, also known as hemochromatosis, uh, you see it with porphyria and B12 deficiency. So lots of information. And I wanted to touch base on electrophoresis because I know as you're studying, you know that you have to order this to diagnose certain conditions. But I wanted to teach you that there are different tests of electrophoresis and not to confuse you, but just to educate you on the differences. And I have two here that I want to talk about. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is the one that you're probably most common with because this is what we order to look at abnormal types of hemoglobin. And what do I mean by abnormal types of hemoglobin? This may be a little bit more in depth that you need to know for the exam, but it's good to understand that there are some abnormal hemoglobin, such as one called hemoglobin S uh, found in sickle cell. There's a hemoglobin C which does not carry oxygen well, and it's found in anemia. There's a hemoglobin E, which is found in South Asians, and it can cause anemia. Uh, but why would we order this? Well, it helps whenever we see a patient with fatigue, pale skin, jaundice, severe pain, maybe sickle cell, uh, growth problems in children. So it helps with the diagnosis of um, sickle cell, hemoglobin C, C disease, hemoglobin SC disease, uh, but we won't get into what those are. Uh, but that's what electrophoresis, uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis looks at. Now, 
stepping back a little bit, what is electrophoresis? Electrophoresis is a laboratory technique which uses to separate DNA from RNA or protein molecules based on their size uh, and electrical charge. So an electric current is used to move these molecules. That's what electrophoresis does and is. So let me give you an example of another form of electrophoresis that I use commonly in the cancer setting. It's called the serum protein electrophoresis, also known as SPEP. We use this to check for myeloma. It detects something called the M protein, uh, which is an abnormal substance. Now in myeloma, when these M proteins are elevated, the higher the M protein, the worse the myeloma. And with treatment, once we start therapy, we see these M proteins decrease and eventually completely be gone. That's when they go into remission. So let's talk about erythrocyte sedimentation rate, also known as SED rate, um, or the elevation or decreased ESR. What you need to know is that ESR measures how fast the red blood cells sink or set to the bottom of a test tube. Remember, when you draw blood into a test tube and you let the test tube sit for some time, the red blood portion of it will sink to the bottom and the plasma will go to the top, the plasma being the yellowish, clearish kind of color. Now, ESR is seen elevated primarily with inflammation. So think of pregnancy, menstruation, older age. You could also have low levels. Think of um, thick blood. What can make the blood thick? So low plasma protein, sickle cell anemia, uh, leukocytosis, increase in white blood cells, hyperviscosity, polycythemia vera, poly meaning many, cythemia vera, lots of cells in the blood. Now understand that ESR or an elevation of would not be uh, diagnostic. It doesn't tell you what or why. It only tells you there's an underlying inflammation. Uh, it can be used for prognosis. It tells us how the patient may be responding to a therapy. Someone with elevated ESR may need to be referred out for um, more evaluation as to what is causing this inflammation. Now, common symptoms that patients may present with that may want to trigger for you to order an ESR would be someone who's complaining of headache, joint aches, um, digestion problems, pelvic pain, if you see low red blood cells, unexplained weight loss, decreased appetite. But ESR, for the most part, has to do with inflammation. Um, a lot of the times we see in my practice, we will refer these people out to endocrinology to make sure there's not an autoimmune uh, underlying issue that may be causing this inflammation, uh, some kind of like maybe rheumatoid arthritis, you know, maybe lupus, all right, but um, definitely not diagnostic, but it needs to be further evaluated. If you're preparing to take the ANCC or the AANP exam and found my teaching style helpful, I welcome you to check out my website, thecohenreview.com. Find the link in the description below. The Cohen Review offers lectures covering all tested systems, GI, derm, psych, cardiac, with key material to pass the NP boards. You will not be overwhelmed with unnecessary information. We also offer a growing question bank, free blogs, live webinars, and private coaching. I am here to support you into becoming a certified nurse practitioner. So please do yourself a favor, click the link below, and let me give you the tools you need to pass the exam.